This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage that you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at fbhp.com. I'm Amy Wells. This is the OTP, and I am joined by, I mean, the greatest in the land when it comes to <laughs> draft coverage. Rhett wow. Bryan, Coach Mack, Dave McGinnis. Everybody is here, and that can only mean that we are getting ready to start the draft process, the road to Detroit has begun. You guys were at some of the all-star bowls. They are happening. You guys just got back from the senior bowl. And now we're getting closer and closer to the big one. The, the event that I just wait for, I count down the days. That is the NFL scouting combine in Indianapolis. So I figured that it, in this spirit, as we're getting ready to do this, I want to look at some mock drafts. Is that okay? Sure. You are running this show. So <laughs> right. And you just, just called us the greatest just thing ever. So I'm like, yeah, yeah do yeah. what you want. We're just happy to have you back. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. There it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> no, really, you guys are uh, – uh, your insight is just unmatched. I know you guys have been working really, really hard on this. So I decided that to start this, we would look at what I will call the too early mock drafts. There you go. Because it is too early to be doing mock drafts. However, they are happening, and so I would like to look at them. Okay. Um, I only looked at 13 different mocks, just to set the scene a little bit. Jim Wyatt, when he does his tour of the mock drafts on TennesseeTitans.com, right. Jim Wyatt looks at 20. I only looked at 13 because I am not Jim Wyatt. So if you want a real professional's opinion, TennesseeTitans.com is where you can get all of that information. I am a cheap imposter. Only looked at 13. <laughs> That's a baker's dozen, though. We're good. <laughs> yeah, it's, We're it's good. not bad. Um, but I want to kind of break down a little bit okay. who was mocked to come to the Tennessee Titans at number seven in the first round of the NFL draft. And, guys, there's not a lot of variety when you look through this. Um all of them but two had the Tennessee Titans taking an offensive lineman, and seven had the Titans picking Joe Alt, the offensive lineman out of Notre Dame. So I guess we should just jump right into it because I have a lot of questions, and I'm sure the OT people also have a lot of questions. And, Red, I'm going to start with you. Who is Joe Alt, and why is everybody so excited about this guy? And Mac can correct me if I'm wrong, but he's the most polished tackle in this draft class. He's 6'8", 322 pounds. To put it in a Titans relatable way, in terms of someone you could plug in and go, he's the Peter Skaronsky of this draft in the tackles part of this. Uh, allowed just one sack and five total pressures uh, in, in 2023. First team All-American. Uh, and he's got, you know, the the lineage there too. His father was a first-round pick in the 84 draft. He had a 13-year career with the Kansas City Chiefs, two-time Pro Bowler, second-team All-Pro several times. He's in the Chiefs Hall of Fame. So, I mean, he's got some stuff there. But um, the guy has the prototypical size and build. And I know we're going to talk about other tackles. And there's a reason why there's a conversation between him and Olu Fashanu from Penn State. But he's the leader of the class in this, in my opinion. Uh, this is – here, got another notebook, oh. my 39th notebook. So <laughs> yes. You get to look at it. This is off a film study right here from me, which I don't know much. But looking at him, Rhett's already given the size and what he is. You, you write down, here, here's a bullet point. Size, athleticism is good. He's got good feet, uh, lower body flex, which is important for an offensive lineman. Plays out of a three-point stance some too, which is, which is big. He can pull. Good run block and leverage. He's got quickness for a large man. Top IQ football. And this is from talking with people that, I mean, he's a top football IQ dude. Quick set on pass. He, he, he has a nice natural quick set on his pass. A good anchor. Now, on the, on the, on the, on the bottom side of it, he's a little bit of a waist bender at times, which he's going to have to get out of in this league. He's 6'8", so a lot of those guys have problem with, with leverage. But 6'8", you still like it because the reach is there. Uh, at times, he will give too much access to his chest. And then uh, with access to his chest, uh, initially, he needs a better handset. Sometimes when you're watching, you know, a, a series of just pass protection films. Uh, anyway, that's just my quick thumbnail of him. Don't know much, but that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all you need to know. Is it unusual that across the board there is so much consensus at this point? Again, 
this is too early. It's February still. But across the board, there is a real consensus among some of the national people that this guy would be a good fit for the Tennessee Titans. Is that odd? Well, first of all, let me just say this, and not to denigrate the mock drafts, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> These people have no idea because teams aren't telling them anything right now. Right. They're not telling them anything. But when you look at it, you look at what the Titans need, and then you look, this guy's at the top of the he, – he and Olu are at the top of the – tackle class this is a deep tackle class so does that surprise me no just looking at what the titans need and what the titans uh, clearly with with that pick the picking number seven which is the highest the titans have picked in quite a while this guy this guy would deserve a pick in the top 10 now there were two people who predicted that the tennessee titans would take olu fashanu so Rhett, tell me a little bit about him and why he might be a better fit so olu fashanu is and this is where the difference of opinion lies in terms of who who's the top tackle in this draft. Is it Joe Alter? Is it him? And you're going to get a lot of people saying Olu Fashano because he's 6'6", 317. He's got the ideal size and length and all of those things. He is not quite as polished as Joe Alt, but he is more athletic than Joe Alt. And I, Mac will tell you that in his thumbnail description. Is that it for you, Red? That's it for me right now. Okay, is that enough for him, Amy? I, we that good? was enough for him. Okay, yeah. well, you're running this thing. Well, I mean, Olu, no. Olu Fashanu. Both of these guys are one, two, two, one, depending on what the, the, the boards are going to be set. Here's off the tape. Body mass, well proportioned, exceptional athlete. He's got light feet for a big man. Good hand strength, lateral agility, good anchor versus speed to power, which is important with a big with a big long guy. Good second level in space. Plays with a little bit of high pad level. Of course he is six six. Uh, needs better leverage at times. He he's not as heavy, okay, versus in the run game. He's not as heavy in the run game. Yeah, when you're looking at him. And there, there'll be times, even though with his quick feet, he can overset some in a pass rush. Either one of these guys, you'd be very happy to have on your team. And both of these guys will probably, again, I can't say this with any kind of certainty. Uh, I don't know what the good Lord's got in mind for any of us, but probably 10 to 12 year players in this league. Other people who were named as potential top draft picks for the Tennessee Titan are Tali Fala. Tali Fuaga and J.C. Latham. Are those guys that you can also see as being a fit for the Tennessee Titans? Absolutely. Like those make sense? Absolutely. And, and, and Rhett, I think Rhett will back this up if he does it. I don't care. <laughs> is, that, is that there are th – this is a good tackle draft. This is a very good tackle draft. And both of these guys that you mentioned, uh, you know, if you want Rhett to go first with his, with his, but both of these guys clearly are in the top tier of tackles that you just mentioned, Amy. Tally Fuaga, first of all, we had a chance to speak to him. He was on a previous OTP, and he is a mammoth human being. 6'5", 332, a, a wing span of nearly 82 inches. Enormous hands at 10 and 2 eighths inches that uh, are violent hands. I mean violent. Probably one of his best suits in this thing. He and Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma probably helped themselves as much as anybody that week in Mobile. And he's predominantly been a right tackle in college, but there's a lot of folks, including, I believe, Coach Dave McGinnis, that think his game will translate and he could be relied upon as a left tackle. J.C. Latham, predominantly right tackle at Alabama, another enormous human being, 6'6", 360. Um he had, uh, I think, no sacks uh, Latham did in 13 starts at right tackle at Alabama, which, you know, they're facing the best of the best every week. But uh, both of these guys, really good prospects. Yeah, they really are, and, and, and I, I agree with Rhett. Uh, which one you want first, Amy? Which one you want first off a of tape? Uh, I don't Tally? care. Pick your favorite. Yeah. Okay, we'll go. We'll go, with Tally. I've got no favorites yet. It's too early for favorites. <laughs> it's too okay. early for any of this, but we're doing it. Uh, yeah, you called it the too early mock draft. Sure right. did. Uh, Tally, uh, again, when we sat down with him, you can just sense it. This is this is a dude, and you want him. He played over fifteen hundred snaps at right tackle, so that that that's a lot. Uh, he's a physical player. He's decent on the second level. His arm length is outstanding. That Red just Red just wrote off. Uh, inconsistent feet at times. He oversets and drifts a little bit when you're looking at him. His run game though is very good. He's got heavy heavy hands. I think Red said violent hands. You don't want this guy slapping you. I mean you just don't. I mean he's got he got heavy hands. He 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 needs. 
really when you start watching his game, and he is he is a violent player. He really needs more, and I wrote down this, he needs a little bit more fundamental uh, patience because, I mean, he just wants to he wants to beat you up. And, and But visiting with – I love talking to this guy. Love talking to this guy. He's got an offensive lineman mindset. Again, one of the top-tier players. J.C. Latham is a monster of a human being. Uh, length, body mass, strength. He's athletic in the pass pro. Good, strong hand punch. Good anchor. Strong in the run game. This is a strong run game guy. He's a right tackle, but this is a strong run game guy. He'll get overextended at times because he's so big, and he really wants to maul you off the line of scrimmage on inside counter moves in the pass game, give him problems because he go, he's going after you. I mean, he wants to hurt you. He's got a high IQ. He needs to sustain a little longer. And again, all of these guys, and again, I don't, I don't nitpick guys. I just look because all of this can be corrected. But any of these taller guys, you're always going to see some waist bend if you watch enough tape on these guys. But it, all these four, you've picked four of the best ones. Well, I didn't pick them. The the people of okay, well, I just gave of you the credit. internet. I just gave them. you credit for it. And then you took it away. You, 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 called us, you called us gurus, so I'm just putting and giving you there. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Here on the OTP, we like to educate. This is one of the things that we do here. And um, I want to ask the question about hands because you guys have both used terminology to describe hands that I've never heard before violent hands, heavy hands. As we go through this process, you hear a lot of strange terms to evaluate people that you wouldn't typically hear in conversation. But I want to know what exactly that means. What are you looking at? What are you seeing when somebody has violent or heavy hands? Well, the, the line of scrimmage is a hand game. It's a complete hand game. First of all, you know, Rhett in, in all of his, his profiles will give you the, the width, the wingspan. That's big. That's huge for everybody because the further as an offensive lineman that you can keep the defender away from you and with a violent punch initially because you're talking about uh, two to two and a half to 2.7 seconds if you're throwing the football that you want to keep them off of the, out of the cylinder. So the longer that your arms are and the more violent and the stronger your punch is, then when you have to reset your hands, when you have to reset your hands, you can get a good violent punch, but if, you're, if you don't have strong enough hands, then your hands collapse. And if you, if you collapse, and you'll hear, you'll hear people talking about he lets him into his chest too much. As a defensive coach, you're always trying to win the inside hand game. You're trying to win the inside hand game, get to the offensive lineman's chest, and then that way you've got him controlled. Because once you're in, once you're in his chest, then he's out here like an octopus and can't do anything with you. You've got to, you want to get in his chest, and so arm length, hands, and strong punch. It, the whole game is hands inside. Is that physical attributes or is that a learned skill? There's, it, it's both. Okay. It's both because I mean, you know, if if you've got T Rex arms, well then it's gonna. I don't <laughs> care how strong they are, you, you, they're gonna get into your chest. Longer arms, you can keep separation. You can teach hand placement though. Good offensive line coaches, and we've got a great one coming here. Uh, to to Tennessee, a great one, and I don't use those terms often. I know I've coached against this dude. Anyway. The, the hand technique, hand placement, there's so much, there, there is so much nuance to hand placement with offensive line play, people have no idea. And that's what we're here for, is give you a little bit of an idea, but it's important. So great question, but it can be taught, but you have to have, you have, to have at least the requisite physical ability to be taught. And Amy, one of the reasons why, it, it, one of the more obvious reasons why hands are so important, especially for tackles, is they're going to be every week seeing veteran pass rushers who have honed their skills and their craft, and they have their first pass rush move, and then they have an alternate. Whether it's a swim move or a bull rush or a spin move or a chop, rip, and dip, whatever it is, they're going to see a variety of guys attack them different ways. And the first line of defense, in this case, for lack of a poor pun, <laughs> uh, lack of a poor line there, is it, the hands that's why the waist bending and the feet and all those things, but the hands is where it starts. And to Max's point, with a coach like Bill Callahan coming to the Tennessee mm -hmm. Titans, there's a lot of things that can happen, a lot of teaching that can occur with a young guy coming in to be a part of this offensive line. So knowing all of that, and Red, I'll start with you, does it seem like almost a foregone conclusion that the Titans will be drafting an offensive lineman? Or is there still a long way to go and this is a too early thing to say? It's a too early thing to say. I think that logic would tell you, knowing what you need with the offensive line, that yes, at seven you should do that. But we have not seen the combine. We have not had the new fiscal year and the new 
deal with free agency and, and whether guys are released, cut, traded, re-signed, franchise tag, whatever. So there's so many things that have to fall into place before kind of you see what the picture is because it depends on what the Titans do in free agency, and they have a lot of money to be able to kind of make some moves there. So uh, there's – Logic says yes, but the timing is too early, in my opinion. At some point, you'll draft an offensive lineman. I can't tell you where yet. Uh, I'm not smart enough at all these mock drafts because they'll tell you exactly where people are going to go. I can't, but they will draft an offensive lineman or two in this draft and develop them. Yes. Huh. All right. Well, Titans fans, it's always game on with Duncan, so grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get on your game. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. I'm glad that you guys mentioned that it's too early, keeping with the theme of too early hot takes, because there <laughs> is another position group that has been mocked to the Tennessee Titans. Oh, yes, my friends, the tight end. There have been not one but two mock drafts that have the Tennessee Titans taking Brock Bowers, the tight end from Georgia, at number seven. Rhett Bryan, I will start with you. Who is Brock Bowers? Why should we be excited about this? Well, if unless you've been under a rock, Brock <laughs> Bowers is the top tight end in this class. And I don't believe it's close. There's a couple other names you're going to hear uh, that I think they're a distant second and third. But uh, 6'4", 240 um, is not your – you know, typical inline blocker. He is more of a giant wide receiver with super good skills, and they lined him up all over the place at Georgia. They did line him up in line. They did use him in the slot. They did use him out wide. Um, so, you know, his upper body strength is not one of those that he's going to be this big blocking prowess thing. He's going to be a weapon for you in the pass receiving game. And he is the top of the class when it comes to that. He comes from a family of athletes. His father was a college football player at Utah State. His mother is a Hall of Fame softball player. His sister currently plays softball uh, at Sacramento State. So th there's athletics all through the genealogy of, of his uh, family there and, and his makeup. But we've seen what he's done at University of Georgia, two-time national champion. And on the biggest stages, he's shown up very brightly. Yeah, that's – I mean, that's spot on. I mean, there's a big separation in these tight ends. You know, now, the, the four guys, the tackles that we talked about previously, it, there's there's nuance separation, but they, you could all make an argument, you know, but the, these guys, you can see those – this guy here is is the best tight end by far, by far. And the separation, once we start stacking our board, and we'll start to stack our board after the combine, after more work, we, we won't, we'll start stacking it vertically and horizontally. That's later on in the process. But this guy, there's a huge separation. Just off a of film study with this guy – Plus athlete, number one. Which, I mean, just plus athlete. You start looking at athletic skills, you put a plus on your grade sheet. Explosive. Yards after catch, off the chart. All right? He's a tough matchup. He's a, he's a monster matchup against safeties. He'll be a monster – he'll be a, a mismatch against linebackers. Now, you're going to have to put a cover guy on this guy if you're a defensive coach. Ball skills are outstanding. Hands, play strength and body control. He's got that, especially in space. He's got a motor. Uh, he's got energy, inline blocker, needs consistency, just what Rhett said. He's got speed. I, I just wrote potent weapon, star, it's over. And speaking of the speed, I think it'll be one of those interesting things to see what he runs 40-wise at the Combine. Uh, he, there's been some reports he had some sub four or five runs in college timed. Now that's, you know, but when the real guys are sitting there, timing uh, i'm interested to see how close to four or five or below he gets for a guy that again is going to measure somewhere close to six four 240 pounds well the thing that jumps out at you on film is that he runs away from guys in space in the southeastern conference that tells you enough in terms of position of need bringing this back to the tennessee titans where does tight end rank is that a high priority for this team well you say high priority i mean yeah at number seven? Sure. That's pretty high. Okay. That's fair, though, because there are times, and Mac, you can speak to this better than anybody else, there are times, though, when the athlete justifies the position more than a position group. Is that right? 100% right. Best available kind of 
scenario. Hundred percent right. Yeah. And, and and the the thing I think that that brings a, a real uh, light to the point that you're that you're making is that this guy is head and shoulders above any other tight end in this draft. Now there are some guys, you know, they're they're going to play in the league, and there's some guys that will be drafted. I mean, I've got three pages of them, but this guy is over and above the top of them, probably falling into that category that you're talking about. In terms of putting together an offense as this team is starting to craft things, and again, we don't know what's going to happen in free agency. We don't know what this roster is going to look like come April. Um, But there is something to be said to having a dominant tight end because that position is so involved in so many different parts of an offense. Well, it, if anybody watched the Super Bowl, which 125 million people did, so surely <laughs> some of the OT people did, and I know they all did, is that you, you watch those both, both of those teams that are in it got two dominant tight ends. Both of the teams had two dominant tight ends. And Mac is not a comp player person because he spent his living – and his mortgage riding on it. But I'll say this. A lot of people are going to say Brock Bowers has a comp to a George Kittle. Wow. So, that's a big – Yeah. That's a big name there. Does it matter to anybody – because, again, this is too early, and I feel <laughs> the need to keep saying this. Um, does it matter to anybody that in a interview he said that the team that he would like to play for is the Tennessee Titans? I'm glad he said it. Yeah, I mean, it's but fun. Really. But, I mean, he has no control over that. He's got none. Yeah, he's got no control. But the fact that he said Tennessee Titans, uh, sure. I mean, sure. You, you like that. But, like Rhett said, you got – it's just – in the draft, let me tell you, let me tell you where the, those players want to go, whoever picks them. And the, the higher you pick, the more happy you are to go there because that's just what this league is. It really is. And so – he, at least he didn't give – he tried to give the stock answer that – and he said it first, I'll be happy to go anywhere, which they all are, which mm-hmm. they should be. But they pressed him a little bit, and he said, oh, yeah, you know, the, the, the Tennessee Titans. I love that area. But as a scout, that doesn't do anything for you? No. As an evaluator of humans, as someone who's putting together a roster, you don't care? No. But it's fun. <laughs> it's just not fact. Yeah, it's fun. It, talking about things that are fun and then talking about things that are facts. Yeah, it's like <laughs> saying the rest of this winter in Tennessee, we're going to have sunshine at 70 degrees. Well, I have no control over that. That probably not going to happen. All right. That's a good analogy. <laughs> but it's fun. And it is fun. As we're going through this, we have now wrapped up our tour of the uh, two early mock drafts. What other position groups should – the OT people be paying attention to as we continue down our road to Detroit? Well, when you look at this draft, this is an unusual draft for this reason. The numbers are different, especially in the, in the belly of this draft. And the belly of the draft really starts right at the end of the second, second round all the way through. The belly of the draft has been diminished because of NIL. These guys are going back to school for money. And so, I mean, we, we heard it from Jim Nagy. Down there at, at, at the Senior Bowl, I've heard it from scouts that I've talked to, you know, ar- around the league, uh, just in, in talking about the numbers of people that will be in the belly of the, uh, in the belly of the draft. The the positions right now, when you start going through it, that look like they're standing out, that have a number of of very draftable players. The offensive lineman is one. The tackles especially, but there are guards and centers in this draft also. So you're talking about numbers that you should be paying attention to. And then the wide receiver group. The wide receiver group has several people that, that will, will be in the belly of the draft as you start working through three days of this draft. And the other position is cornerback. There are corners in this draft that will be taken. Now, some have gone back to school because, as I said, this is unusual. You've got, you've got uh, the last, nearly the last of the COVID people that had extra years added you know, to their eligibility, and plus the, the fact that NIL, now these guys can make two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 if they're that kind of player in playing collegiate football for another year. So all of that being said, offensive linemen, cornerbacks, and wide receivers, there's numbers there in this draft. I'm going to answer your question a different way because uh, he's mentioned some of the strength. One that is intriguing to me, and it always is, is the running back position. And, of course, if you've taken a look at what the free agent list is like, potentially, as we said here in mid-February, there's some big names on that because the, the position has been devalued over time. 
I mean, Saquon Barkley is potentially there. Derrick Henry's potentially there. I mean, you just start running the list. And then you go back to his argument, Coach Mack's argument about NIL. That has created issues as well. But there are some really good value running backs that you will see in the middle of this draft. I don't think there will be anyone taken in the first round. In fact, um, prior to us putting this together today, I saw – uh, Dane Brugler of the Athletic, his top 100 board that he put out, he didn't have a running back to pick 65, but he had a bunch after that. And there's some good ones in here. Whether you're talking about Trey Benson from Florida State, Jonathan Brooks from Texas, Blake Corum, who we saw in the national championship game from Michigan, uh, Austin Estime, the running back for Notre Dame, and then some of the guys we saw at the Senior Bowl, Ray Davis, who started his career here in Nashville at, at Vanderbilt and had a really good year in Kentucky last year, uh, Marshawn Lloyd, who started at, at uh, South Carolina and went to Southern Cal, and then a guy we really liked at the uh, the Senior Bowl, who was a small school prospect, Dylan Lowby from New Hampshire, who is a really nice running back in terms of what you're looking for in this day and age. He reminds me a lot of the the smaller type running backs that the, the Patriots would have back in the day. And a receiver against Central Michigan last year, 12 catches, 295 yards and a touchdown as a running back. Wow. Yeah. Lobby was an interesting guy. The, the, the other thing to, to keep in mind as you start going through this draft, you know, that we're digging into, some of these guys are older now because they've gotten the extra year. So you're talking about 24, 25-year-old running backs. Labe is going to be one of them. You know, he's a, a 24-year-old guy. Uh, he is a Danny Woodhead type of a dude. He really is. But when you, when you put, put the film on, you go, oh, and then you sit and talk with him. I mean, this is a dialed-in dude, but you're, you're dealing with a lot of variables now when you start looking at, at this draft in particular, you know, from a, a, an organizational point of view, because you've got some older guys in this draft now because of the extra years that, they're, that, they, that they've gotten because of COVID. The age is an interesting thing because on one hand, having an older guy means that maybe he's a little bit more mature, he's a little more dialed in, he understands the nuances of the game a little bit better. He's just an older, more mature human who's been playing for longer. But then there's the issue of wear and tear on the body and do you get him for as long? And there's there's that factor as well. On the other hand, you have some younger guys like a Joe Alt who's coming out early He'll be 21 at the end of this month. Are there questions about – He'll be 21 about, his whole rookie year. Are there questions about age and maturity and all of that? Not with him. I guess more in general. But, yeah, I mean, he's he's a guy that obviously that's not a factor. But overall, navigating the age differences between guys in a draft – is a new thing or a relatively new problem, right? Well, no, it, it's been there. It's been there the whole time. But what that's where your face-to-face -face interviews come in. That's where your 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 visits that you have when you bring them to your after after the after the combine. You've got your visits at the combine, both your your official visits and then your train station visits that now take place all in the same place in, 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 in the bottom of of Lucas Oil, but. That's why it's important to get face to face with these guys. That a lot of that comes in, and then that's why the combine. And we love the combine. I've been oh, to every we one do. Of them. You <laughs> love the combine. <laughs> Rhett loves the combine because there's just so much information you can gather there. But at the, at the same time, one of the biggest things about the combine that that is so helpful to clubs is the is the consistency of the medical exams. And so all of this, you know, will come in. But the, all of these factors that you're bringing up, Amy, that when you're in it, when you're you're in a draft process, and and you're you're sitting in these draft meetings that take a long time. You know, when you finally get everybody together, they've already been through their backboard here. You know, they told us that you know about three weeks ago. They've been through their backboard. But now, once you start getting there and grinding, all of these issues that you're talking about will come up and will be discussed very, very at length. SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or to any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. I think it's interesting to mention all of the things that we have coming up because if you haven't noticed the theme that this is too early to be doing this um, – <laughs> There will be a time that it's not too early anymore. There will be a time where mock drafts are looking more realistic and have more informed opinions. Um, there will be times when you're taking into account what a team's roster looks like, what 
a performance at the combine, a performance at a pro day. All of those things will make these a little more informed and a little less just shots in the dark. Um, when is that time? When can people start looking at a mock draft and going, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that might be, oh, okay. Like, when is that time? Well, again, let me say, having been on the inside of this for a long time, you don't tell anybody what you're going to do. And so the smoke gets thicker the longer you go into it. Because then, you know, it, it, you know the gamesmanship comes into it. Do I want to put out there something that maybe somebody else is thinking this is what I want, so they're going to move to get up, and I don't really want that. I want to – all of that happens. It, it, that goes on. So, again, I'm just saying, uh, just like that stop sign I put up every now and then when Rhett gets, you know, with the Coach Mac <laughs> bit emoji, when Rhett gets out of control, it has Coach Mac going, stop. So when you get into this stuff, just understand there's a lot more going into it. Now, your point – as to when, when you can start kind of zeroing in, though, it's after free agency. It's after free agency, and it's after all the official visits and the school workouts. So that's still time to go. We're right at the beginning of it. Now, these scouts have been working for 12 months already on this group. They've already put 12 months of work in. You know, so they know. They know. But now, when you start refining it, it's after all of those other things. All three of us know and our OT people know everything in the National Football League happens on schedule. It happens, and there's a deadline for everything. So your question, after free agency, after the combine, after the school visits, all of those things, that's when it starts coming into focus. Yeah, I would answer it by saying the first half of the month of April, uh, which works out with that timeline. Uh, now, for me, because I love this stuff so much, I've been doing uh, mock draft simulators for a month now. See, there's um, Rhett. Yeah, <laughs> and from Our all guy. different – there's several different ones to choose from. Um, but, uh, yeah, because I love being able to see – especially after we've been to the Senior Bowl, I'll do it even more after we get back from the Combine because you'll be able to see some of these guys, talk to these guys, kind of see where they measure up, what they do, and just continue to, to look at things. Um for anybody out there that loves those things, I love them just as much as you do. They're fun. Well, the, the, this, and I will say this, this talent acquisition period uh, at, for this franchise is a really, really important one. And all of that, so, I mean, th this is, I love talking about it. I love the draft. I love, the, I like the talent acquisition part of it. Uh, you know, I didn't know it when I first got into the league. I was taught how to do it. And I, I absolutely, and it, it, it's, it's the lifeblood of what you do. Because the better you are and the more fortunate you are at, at picking players, the better chance you have to be playing in that game that we just saw last weekend. As a Titans fan, this is a really fun time to be a nerd about this kind of absolutely stuff. Absolutely it is. It absolutely is. And, and the interest is you, – you, I mean, we've all – I've seen the combine grow from when it was so small that only coaches and players could get in and you had to be double ID'd to be able to get into it. Where now our fans can come to it, they see. I mean, I, I absolutely love that. I do because it, it it is important and and that involvement. But there is still a business part of it that is pretty concrete. We have one more week to wait. Is that right? Am I doing this right? Twenty eighth is when it starts. Yeah. Right? So we got one more full week. We after have one this more full week, and then it's go time. And I, I know you guys are fired up. I'm just beside myself. <laughs> and we're, of course, going to be in Indianapolis. So Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Amy? Am I going to see you again? One of my favorite Amy Wells stories at the Combine is when you wore the wrong shoes the night we went out and you're, you're, you, you had so many blisters on your feet that we're, we're in the Combine and all of a sudden I look up and Ashley's pushing you on a cart. Uh, from from <laughs> from the media from the media center to go into the, uh, to to do an interview at Lucas Oil. Am I going to see that again? I hope not. Yeah, <laughs> I I have since thrown those shoes away okay. and got better shoes. Um, I'm more of a loafer sneakers kind of <laughs> there girl it is. now, as opposed to the heels I decided you, it your, to it wear. It showed your dedication. Yeah. You could not walk. I couldn't. And oh. but you were going to get to. Lucas Oil to do your job. Yeah. And you did it. Yeah. And uh, I will show the same level of commitment this year when we all head out to Indianapolis <laughs> for the scouting combine. I will wear better shoes. Um, 
It's going to be great. I'm so excited. I can't wait for all of the coverage we're going to have. Of course, we're going to have all the OTPs. We are going to have everything we possibly can at TennesseeTitans.com. We're going to keep the OT people in the know because they are just as fired up about this time of year as we are. Oh, absolutely. And, I, and can I ask you all something else, too? Don't, yes. don't walk away from me when we're downtown and leave me when I'm talking to people. because. Well, Mac, you've got to keep your interactions to like 30 seconds or under. Just a quick hi, hello, and then c- keep going. When you know everybody, you've got to ration your time. I mean, I, 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 I mean, do you fear for your safety or yeah, something? I feel sad. I oh, feel wow. sad when okay. I look up. And well, Amy, Amy turns around and said, we're leaving. I don't know what you're doing. We're leaving. <laughs> well, I, I, I hate it when you're sad. <laughs> But I need you to manage your time a little bit better. We're traveling as a group. All right. We're wrapping this up now. (laughs) For Coach Mac, Brett Bryan, I'm Amy Wells. This has been the OTP. We're heading to Indy, guys. It's coming. Tighten up.